Have you ever wondered how your sales performance compares against your competitors and peers? The B2B Sales Benchmark Report provides the definitive guide to what success looks like in 2021. See how you compare in terms of win rate, sales cycle, average deal value, relationships, and engagement. You can see the results and get the full report at ebster.com forward slash B2B dash sales dash benchmarks. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales operations onto the show to deconstruct the why, what, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by Ebster, the leading customer engagement platform for Salesforce. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Sales Optimized. We're joined by Kevin Raybon of Sopsa. Um, and Kevin has extensive experience um, in sales operations, um, being well, practically running sales operations at large organizations such as Thomson Reuters, um, and now has moved on to direct this organization, which seems to me, from my research, to, to stand for this great profession. And so I think we're going to have a super interesting discussion, both about Kevin's experience, but also about what SOPSA are now currently doing for the space. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I've uh, been watching uh, the episodes on the web, and uh, it, it's great to hear from other other practitioners. I think we don't get to do that often enough. So thanks for putting this together. Uh, it's, an, it's an absolute pleasure. It's kind of been like going down into the rabbit hole for me. Like I don't have a background really in sales or sales operations, and now I think we're on approximately interview number forty. If I, I, I feel like this this whole new world has opened up, um, but. This is going to be super interesting because of your experience. How did you first initially get into sales operations? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we all have an interesting journey as we get into sales ops. My background starts with really being technical. I grew up as a kid writing software, and you know we come into sales ops in lots of different ways. Um, a lot of people come from finance or marketing. I, I come from the technical side. I've um, been a software company for a number of years. Um, but over the years, as I moved from startup to large software company, um, I, you know, I got to bring forward my passion for solving business problems with me. And there's no better place to solve business problems than on the commercial side of the business. There's always something going on. Um, so, you know, my first round at sales operations was with a company called Computer Associates. They recently got acquired by Broadcom. Um, but uh, at sales at Computer Associates, I had started doing sales ops kinds of things um, well before I was part of sales ops. I was helping to helping the local, local uh, the regional managers and sales here in, in the Dallas area put together new territory designs, uh, new organization charts. Uh, some companies go through that often and they seem to. So that was something that was in big need. You know, doing uh, compensation plan assistance, um, calculations and so forth. But, you know, I started off uh, in a doing those types of things at computer associates but then i ended up um because many of the changes that i built went I went international they brought me to the headquarters and formerly into the sales ops organization to help take those things up across the company uh, so that's that's how i got into sales ops and from that point forward it's it's been you know helping people solve sales ops challenges of different types uh, for the last really the last 16 years Nice. And I see this a lot with people moving into the into the trade is that they, they start doing stuff. A lot of people I speak to, they are doing something or they're doing sales ops unofficially, either mm-hmm. as a role as a salesperson or a finance, and then they get brought in. So similar to you, it seems like you were doing stuff that was sales operations, and then you only were officially brought in when they wanted to roll that out globally. Is that right? Right. That's really the case. You know, it's, um, you know, I think one of the things we've been working on over the last 15 years or so as sales ops has kind of come into its own is trying to define what it is. And then people are really seeing the value of once we define what it is, let's pull those things together so we can work more tightly together 
and not have a lot of shadow organizations across the company that are really fractured in how they do things. So yeah, just uh, uh, that's exactly how I got into it. Got it. <laughs> and then from, from there, you then went to lead sales ops teams, right? At, according to your LinkedIn profile, Snyder Electric and Thomson Reuters. Um, what was the, the scale of sales ops teams that you were responsible for? Yeah, so, you know, um, when I was first brought into lead sales operations at NAC, um, it was to, to start sales ops. And so, um, and I don't know about you, but I think it's kind of interesting that when you look at a sales ops job description for a leader, it's probably the only leader that says, must be willing to roll up sleeves. <laughs> and I think all of us have to do that. Um, and so, it, my first team was me at NAC Corporation, right? Um, based almost a billion dollar revenue here in the States. And, um, but from that point, we grew into a team of 10 um, at, at, uh, at NEC, where we had sales systems or forecasting. Um, we then moved into sales training and development, um, and then ultimately into um, things that are further down the pipeline, like order prep and, and customer success. So um, at, at NEC, it was a team of from one to 10, uh, but then, you know, most recently at Thomson Reuters, a team of almost 60 people across the world that were, that were dealing with the full gamut of, of sales, sales operations process. Got it. And that team of 60 at Thomson Reuters, how many sales people were you supporting approximately? At Thomson, yeah, in the division I was a part of, we, have about, we had about 1,250 reps. Um, we were a big split between field and inside uh, reps. Um, I think the split was probably about half and half once we kind of got through the last fiscal year. Um, I think a lot of organizations are going through the big shift from field-based to more inside reps. Uh, but yeah. to answer your question, it's about 1,250. Got it. So the ratio I'm getting there is approximately 20 uh, reps per sales off employee, um, which is kind of in the middle of the range. I've been trying to gauge this from all attendees, and that's kind of in the middle of the range. Um, but that's astounding that you are supporting that many salespeople. I think this might be the biggest, the biggest sales team that's ever been supported by someone on the podcast. Well, great. I'm glad, I'm glad to uh, be a first. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we quickly jump in to the tech stack that you were using at Thompson Reuters? Um, just name the, of a few of the core tools. Right. So, you know, it's important to understand in a company that big, it grew by acquisition. And so we were constantly consolidating. Um, but the core that we landed on from an ERP perspective was SAP 4 HANA. Uh, then Salesforce, we had multiple instances of Salesforce because of the acquisitions that we had gone through. So we were bringing together those instances into Salesforce uh, and working to come off of some in-house CRM type systems as well. So CRM is, is Salesforce, um, CPQ is Aptus. Um, we were making a move from, um, again, homegrown plus big machines and some Aptus to all Aptus. From a, a data a master data management perspective, it was the, um, the Informatica suite. So we used them for all their master data management tools, uh, including the ETL and data movement tools. Um, and then when you get beyond that and you look at things like ICM, Incentive Compensation Management, uh, we had landed on Verisent, which is now called IBM ICM. You know, IBM is great for, for TLAs, so it's now ICM. Um, but it was the product that used to be called Verisent. Um, we found from, a, from being able to model the organization that we had and the multiple complex comp plans um, that Verisent was really the best. Um, so when you look at the, the core stack, uh, I really consider it the data, where that data is updated, which is in CRM, and then how we take care of our salespeople with, um, with compensation. That's the ultimate core. But then when you get to the next ring around that, I look at things like sales enabling platforms. We have, uh, we have been using Seismic. We've landed on Seismic as our tool for sales communications. And, um, you know, because we were really trying to solve a problem where people just couldn't find stuff. Or, and also, we were spending a lot of money on things that, um, well, frankly, we weren't using. So we needed to have a full feedback loop back to marketing and product managers so they could understand what, what we were actually using and finding value from. And Seismic fit both of those. It's a big win for us. Um, on the LMS side for sales, uh, we were kind of locked into a, a platform that was a corporate platform used by um, our HR team, plus some of our products, actually, some of our offerings at Thompson were education products. So we landed on a, a system called Docebo uh, for our, our LMS. Um, now, when you go, 
to the, the next ring around that. So all of those systems kind of help us do the corporate things that we need to do to, to take care of our sales team. And then there's the things around productivity. And I think that's where there's a lot of, um, a lot of innovation going on. Your, your, your suite of products for one thing is, is a great tool there. You know, but when we look at uh, other solutions there, our um, inside sales teams uh, were piloting outreach and sales loft. Um, at the time I, was, I departed, outreach was looking like it was gonna be the winner there. Um, and then we looked at other solutions for, um, for productivity. You know, with those inside salespeople, it's important to make sure that they, they don't spend too much time deciding who they're gonna call next, right? And so we, we piloted and had a lot of success with a firm called Connect and Sell, uh, which enabled us to load large lists of, of customers that needed to renew, for example, and they did the dialing, and what we ended up doing was just picking up the phone every time somebody on the other side picked up. So we were able to really cut down that time. It was so. Those are some of the the, the, the key solutions from a you know inner ring, you know first level and and second tier. And that's quite an interesting solution. So they would actually be doing, or some software would be doing the ringing, and then you get alerted when someone was on the phone, and you can jump on. Yeah, it's it's a pretty sweet uh, a pretty sweet solution. Cool. Um, now, you mentioned having multiple Salesforce orgs. We have, or a lot of people have challenges getting the data straight and accurate in one. What were you doing to try and manage the data around all these different orgs, uh, the, the quality of the data? You know, great question. So let me back up one, two. I need a, you know, BI is an important part of all that. I can't believe I missed that. But on the BI side, uh, we our corporate solution is Tableau. However, we found a lot more uh, benefits out of a tool like Inside Squared, where it, it came to us not as a toolkit, but as a, a suite of reporting solutions that are designed for the entire revenue operations cycle. So, um, you know, so it's, you know, Insight Squared was our tool for visualization for Salesforce. So um, when we look at the data quality, is that your question here? I'm sorry, I started talking and missed the question. Is it around data quality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Data, data quality is a huge challenge, right? So because um, we had multiple different solutions where we, we, we tried to, well, we had master data management uh, with Informatica and it would pull um, records and um, nightly and update our orgs and keep them in sync with the various ERPs that we have. Um, successful on, on one level um, in the fact that at an account level, we had a good view of, of the accounts that we served, although um, any, you know, we still made it hard for our sales reps because we had multiple accounts um, uh, for the same for the same um, for the same entity, and it could be quite confusing at times. Um, and then some things were just sometimes just too hard for us to do around activity management and so forth. And you know, it, frankly, we were still still working so hard on account and contact um, order um, and opportunity management that uh, our focus was not shifted toward activity quite yet. Okay, I do have a question here. Uh, Liam, what are the key, this is quite a broad one, what are the key things to consider when building sales processes? Considering sales processes? Well, i say a couple of things. One is they have to meet the needs of the business at a broad level, they have to meet the needs of the business, but they also have to be a, um, efficient for your salespeople. So when I, sales process um, is like saying finance process, right? We have to get a lot more specific about what we're talking about. So it really makes sense to, to define the processes um, that you have in very specific terms and how all those processes interrelate. So let's talk about one. I think a lot of times we, we rush off to talk about opportunity management and forecast management. Um, and so if we're talking about opportunity and forecast management, then let's keep it simple. Um, one of the key things is that, you know, I've been in places in really, really big companies where they were very proud of having one sales process. What they really meant was one opportunity process that was coded into their CRM with very specific stages. That's nice. And, and at some level, it helps you measure things more effectively, but you can draw in complete conclusions because you can only have one sales process if your customers are buying from you one way. And um, otherwise, you're just kind of kidding yourself. So um, although it's really important to have standard sales process 
for opportunity management, you got to be really careful to make sure it makes sense with how the customers are buying from you because you may need multiple iterations of that uh, that are kind of mapped back to each other. Um, when it comes to forecast process, having an executive team who's willing to stand up and say, this is the cadence that we're going to run, having that cadence very well defined, having the reports that support that cadence clearly defined, and then the education on how to read and interpret those reports provided to all the sales managers, very important. Um, so um, executive buy-in, standards, repetition, and quick, um, clear process design um, that's, that people can live in. You know, I think sometimes we, we build processes that um, are written on paper, but they're not quite baked before we launch. And that can be a big challenge because unless you go to a team and say, here's exactly how you're going to do this, and here's the tools to get it done, and here's how we're going to manage your success uh, and view you as successful, if we don't have all that ready, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Right? Um, but when we talk about processes and sales, you're, you're hitting on a thing I like to soapbox on, and I won't take the whole time, but we have to understand that territory design, our talent plan, incentive compensation, sales performance, these are all types of processes, recruiting and onboarding, they're all kinds of processes that, that are important for sales and they all interact with each other, right? So I think, you know, the first thing we always need to do is build visibility to pipeline and forecast for our sales teams. But when we start to get beyond that and we get into the other processes of sales, it, it, it frankly gets a lot more fun. Nice, okay. Now, Leon, I hope it helps. Um, can you quickly talk to trying to get the sales reps on your side? Like, how do you get salespeople to buy into something new you want them to do? Well, one is to spend time with them. And two is to make sure that you have the people spending time with your reps are people who can be credible um, and has literally done their job before. I think it's real important. Um, you know, sometimes we like to think that salespeople are a different kind of human and they're not. Um, we all, as humans, need to be able to trust the people that we interact with. And part of that trust is credibility. If, if, if you're interacting with them and you can understand and empathize with their day in the life, um, then you're going you're gonna to get far with them. So when I go into a new role for the first 90 days, I hit the road. I, I talk to the sales managers. I talk to that special person who's the sales, sales administrator for the sales leaders. Uh, because he or she is the one carrying a lot of the load and um, really understands the difficulties and friction in your processes internally. So I really try to work to bond with the sales administrators. And then I, I do workshops with my the sales reps uh, without their managers in the room to talk about what it's like to sell for the company. Um, now, yeah. after that, you have to come out and say, okay, I heard you. Here are the things that I heard. Am I right? If I'm not, please correct me. But you, you invested your time with me, and instead of being in front of a customer, you spent it with me. So thank you. That was very valuable. And here's what I'm going to do with that. You can trust that that investment you made with me is going to turn into things that we're going to advocate for on your, on your side. And in turn, what we request from you is continue to be plugged into the changes and be an advocate with your peers for what we're, what we're, what we're trying to do. So if I have somebody coming in and, and at the end of the day, when I ask the five whys, it comes down to their role is confusing because they're asked to be, they're asking to call on brand new customers and existing customers. Um, they're, they've got conflict with overlay roles in the organization. They don't know how they are supposed to work together as a team. They don't know, you know, how people are compensated. It seems to be just, you know, at odds with each other. Um, and maybe their comp plan is messed up you know, we have to dig into those root things, right? And, um, and so being able to work with the sales team to gain credibility, to have a constructive dialogue about what's really a challenge for them, coming out and hearing what they said and, and confirming that you heard properly. And then finally, it's taking action and showing quick results um, on those things that you heard. Don't make a promise you can't keep. Um, focus on two or three things every six months. Don't try to do everything at once. Um, and you'll gain credibility um, because you listen, you took action, and you made their life better. Some of the things that I choose to do around tool changes are the things that I think can make quick hits. Um, consolidating CRM is not going to be a quick hit for the sales force, right? Um, but 
getting a productivity tool in place that makes their life better. If I put one piece of information in, it gives me five back, um, like a data augmentation strategy, or if they're spending all their time searching for stuff or creating their own um, corporate overview slides, there's no reason for that when we can go find it faster with a tool like Seismic. Or if I'm asking them today to cram in all their activity into Salesforce, um, and then I can just capture that with their digital exhaust as they go from their email or from their mobile device, that's a win, right? So, you know, look for those quick wins that can make the life of the salesperson better. Um, those, those, those are the things that I, I would say. I think we could, we could probably go away and write a blog post on the answer. And I think I might actually get the team to do that because that was an absolute masterclass. Um, do we have a question? Okay, we do have one from Liam, but I'm going I'm to wait there. We'll continue with our questions and we'll come back to that, Liam. Um, can we quickly talk about this, the, the forecasting process you had at Thomson Reuters? Mm -hmm. um, were you, as a sales ops team, responsible for building that forecast, or were you responsible for giving the data to management to make the forecast? Great question. So at Thompson, we were we grew by acquisition. We had multiple business units, and when I came in, the leader of the forecast process was the the chief revenue officer for each of those business units. He or she had their own way of doing that process. Um, some of them were much better than others. Frankly, the best process we had was, was done in the most um, yeah, antiquated way. I mean, it was done on spreadsheets, and I like to joke around and say it was a big chief tablet and a number two pencil. But when they can use a basic process that is lightly augmented with technology and produce remarkable results, you have to learn from that, right? Not, not all the time do we need to completely automate something for it to be at a high quality of execution, right? So um, to answer your question, we did not have a single sales forecasting process. However, the business unit leaders um, worked with their local sales ops representatives in their business unit to run that process. So to make sure that the, 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 the forecast data was gathered on a regular basis, it was put into the formats that allowed them to review it with their team on a weekly basis and move forward. So what we'd like to get to in, in any place is better top-down visibility. So that means we need to get that forecast into a single technology platform. We need to have standard reporting on top of it so that we then can compare business unit to business unit and, um, and see the entire business in, in one view. So that was where we were moving to. A tool like Inside Squared helped with that tremendously um, because it plugs right into Salesforce. And, and instead of like a Instead of like a, a toolkit, like a, a Tableau or a Verse or a other tool like that, it comes to you with a, um, a library of reports, right? That, that you can pick from and, and train people on. So, um, you know, Salesforce, the sales, the, sales, uh, sales admin, the sales operations team was responsible for providing the rules, providing the process and the tools. Um, but as of the point that I left, they were still consolidating that into a corporate standard. Um, and I'm not sure how relevant this question is, but it'd be interesting to get your insight. Um, alignment between sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you as a sales ops team were involved in any conflict, not conflict, but communication between the two, and, and what's your opinion on that challenge? You know, I think, for one, it's a challenge that I think is overblown. The more we talk about it, the more we put an artificial wedge between the two. So that's my first take on that. Um, second is, yes, sales ops is involved. Sales ops is at the crossroads of, of all these different organizations. And so, you know, I like to say that a good sales ops leader is in the business so the revenue leader can be on the business. Okay. And when you're in the business, you've got to be coordinating with finance, HR, marketing, product, customer success, and making sure that, you know, the, all of those processes are interlocked. One of the biggest challenges between marketing and sales is just data making sure that we're using common data systems so we don't drop anything that's, you know, any demand that's being generated by marketing. And the other one, the other challenge is making sure that there's a closed loop feedback back to marketing about what's working um, and that we're measuring things together that show business success. We don't measure things that are just sales success or marketing success or, you know, we definitely need the, the measurements around the types of leads that we're getting, the quality of those and what happens to them. And it's on both parties to make sure that we look at those kind of metrics with, with the right attitude 
Um, too often you can sit in a meeting with marketing and sales and, and sales says, hey, you're just giving me contacts. These aren't leads. <laughs> and marketing says, yeah, but the things that I give you, you don't do anything with, right? Um, and so to prevent getting into that kind of a situation, you have to have you know, big boy discussions about you know, how we're all in this together. Um, the, the seismic solution was a great benefit for us working with, sales, with working with marketing because it allowed us to sit down, look at all the content we had, put a taxonomy together, organize that, bring it into a tool, and then watch how people used it. We literally were not able to in the past see how well people use things. And in that, in that inventory, it was quite telling because of the thousands of things that we had been producing and paying money to produce, there were many, many things, I won't get into percentages, but it's a big number, that were only used once or twice. And that was based on the clicks that had actually been recorded in the old systems, right? So it really caused us to wake up and see what's valuable. And once you get that closed loop dialogue going and everybody has the, uh, you know, the belief that we're all in this together and we're all about producing revenue and we're all important, um, people start to listen um, when you're talking about us being in this together and having metrics and systems that reinforce that is just a really positive. Um, moving on to KPIs, over your 16 years experience, and this might be a really hard question to answer, um, which KPI do you think has given you the most insight into sales performance? This, might, this, this is going to be probably a, someone you haven't heard, but for me, I look at the percentage of reps on every sales manager's team that are exceeding quota. It's real important. <laughs> The reason I look at that is because my sales managers are my point of scale. And a sales manager's job is not to hit their number on the backs of two people out of a team of 12. Okay? Too often we're focusing on the output of the sales manager's team. And we need to be realizing that a sales manager's job is to help everybody reach their maximum performance. So if we're not equipping the sales manager to have the discussions and manage that full team, we're not getting our maximum sales performance. Okay, so what it comes down to is too often we look at output measurements, right, and we're not looking at objectives and the activities that drive those objectives, right? So um, one of the key ways I look at that is I look at sales manager team performance. We rank them um, internally and start to look at where are sales managers that have the highest percentage of their team getting an exceeding quota, what are they doing different? Um, do we need to adjust the quotas? Do we need to adjust the quotas for the other people? And then we start to ask questions about, well, what about the makeup of those teams that aren't performing? Are there a lot of new reps? Is there a lot of turnover? So it really helps us to start to get into the, the, the why behind these numbers so we can take action on it. And like and to that, that, that metric is also, um, we track new hires like crazy. So a new hire, I like to see day from hire to first dollar sold, day from hire to 50% um, to of quota, the distance between higher and 100% of quota, and the number of um, you know the number of people that are doing those things is really telling. Got it. And that's definitely a metric we haven't heard before. Um, that's super interesting. Um, two final questions, and the first one now kind of brings us on to where you are today and what you've set up. Um, can you give like a brief overview of Soxa, why you're doing it, and what it does? Yeah, so I, here's what I believe. I believe we have a community of sales operations professionals that are waiting to connect with each other. Um, and when we get together, we can move our function forward, we can mature it, and we can also move the careers of people in this function forward. And it's important that we have a, a community that's not a network. And here's the difference. A community is people who can freely interact with each other. A network requires a node to do the introduction. And in my career, I have found that the people I have met in sales ops leadership that have helped me the most, um, I was only introduced to those by vendors, right? And I think we can speed things up, take out a lot of the noise and control if we literally get the sales ops professionals together into a community. Um, and then we start to perform events together um, that, that get us together in small groups of 10 or less, medium-sized chapter groups of you know, tens to hundreds. And then we do some things online um, to bring uh, to bring people together across the world. So that's what SOFS is about. It's 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 about building a community and then giving that community uh, the things that I missed as a sales ops leader. I had a comma in my inbox because I had so much stuff coming to me 
um, internally and externally. Because we're always doing so many projects, it's sometimes hard to stay on top of the things that we should look at externally. And we miss really good things. Well, what if we had a place where we could go where that noise was taken out and we curated that content so that the most relevant things that you needed to learn about were in one place? What about all the events that are out there in the world that are sales ops specific? Um, there are a lot, but you may not know about them. So we curate those events, we put them together into the community. And then we provide the community with tools to get things done, right? Too many times we, um, we are all learning sales operations on the job. And sometimes it can be highly risky. If you've ever done your sales kickoff meeting for the first time or been asked to do a compensation plan redesign for the first time, where do you go for help? <laughs> you can either hire an outside consulting firm and pay them a lot of money, uh, we wanna, or do it yourself and take the risk, right? So we wanted to find some place in between. So within our community, you can find um, a project center where you can find projects that are templates for all of these things. What's your planning cadence? Um, what's your sales compensation rollout plan like for this year? Um, your sales kickoff meeting. If you've never run a president's club, there should be a template for a president's club so you can run that project inside. So we don't always have to start from scratch. So it's about taking the people that I've met over the years in my network, bringing them to the greater sales ops community so we can really take the professionalism of this profession and help grow people's careers. Nice. Um, and we will link above or below this video or if you're on the audio, just Google. On the, on the website, actually, sobster.org. Am I right? Did I get that? Yeah, sobster.org. You want to go and check that out. Um, final question, Kevin. If there's one person within sales ops that you would like to take for lunch, who would that be? The one person I'd like to take to lunch, and I hope she's out there, is Hillary Headley at Zoom. Hillary is, I've seen her speak multiple times. I've gotten to talk to her a couple of times. Uh, Hillary's a mover and shaker in the sales ops space. She does great things very quickly as good sales ops leaders do. Um, and um, if you ever get an opportunity to, to, to be at one of her presentations, I highly recommend it. I, I think she's going to be speaking at Opstars uh, during uh, Dreamforce timeframe in San Francisco this year. Uh, so you might be able to catch her there. Good. Um, well, that was a, an intense lesson on sales ops. Here are the things that I particularly enjoyed. Um, your approach to the sales team, and I actually think we might build a blog post on this, um, about how they're people too, and one of the best things you can do is just literally spend time with them. Like, that, that's so simple. Um, the second thing was about how the, the most effective forecasting process you had at Thompson Reuters was not actually that automated. And mm -hmm. your point about how I actually thinks that, like, maybe it can be automated in the future, but it doesn't have to be automated. Like, you find one working regardless of whether it's automated or not, and then replicate that. Um, so, those lessons were like really simple, like high level stuff, which I actually think apply not just sales ops, but many other like areas of business. So, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to talking to you all again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest, or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com.